apologies in advance for this intro. I'm possibly in the noisiest part of New York under the Brooklyn Bridge. It's been a great visit. And one of the highlights was a seminar I did. It was a two hour seminar at NYU, New York University. The question they had for me is how sampling has changed and evolved and the way in which we work with samples has changed and evolved with it over the last kind of decade and how I saw it changing into the future. And what surprised me about my two hour long answer was that it was uh, an incredibly personal story based on this incredible turn of fate that has happened to me with my job as a samplist, I guess. So I'm going on a journey now, and I just thought I'd use that journey to take you through this story bit by bit, sample by sample. The very beginning of my journey in sampling began 40 years ago when I was seven years old. I was playing a character in a film with Petula Clark as my mum called Joe. And that earned me a sum of money that I wasn't gonna be allowed to spend until I was 16. And you can guess what I spent that on. But there were a couple of other influencing factors that led to me spending my life savings when I was 16 on a sampler. The first of those was 1984, High Street Kensington, Kensington Palace, outside where Princess Diana used to live, close to the edit by Art of Noise. <laughs> The second was, I think, either 1985 or 86, was 19 by Paul Hardcastle. The moment that sampling became a kind of fixation. This was early days of sampling when samplers were very expensive. You didn't have the RAM, you didn't have the performance that you have these days. So basically there were huge limitations. So what people used them for was something experimental, to make a track out of a dog bark. Or indeed, a car horn. It wasn't until Stuart Copeland's score for the equaliser happened. I realised I could take an orchestra and play that. Whilst it was clear that he'd use orchestral samples, which I found very exciting, I think in a fair light, it didn't sound like an orchestra, but not, not in a bad way. And it wasn't because the sounds were primitive, it was just the way he was using it was not how you would use an orchestra in nature. A friend of my dad, Paul Ferris, who had written the score for a very famous film called Witchfinder General, was trying his hand at film composition again and had bought a sampler called the Kurzweil K250 XP and had fallen on hard times and wanted to be relieved of it. So, well, I relieved him of it, which I believe set me on a path that ended up here. And actually thinking about it now, I can't think that there were that many 16 year olds in 1987 who owned a sampler. With one, of course, glaring exception, <coughs> Ferris Bueller. But to be 47 years old now and to have owned and used samplers for 31 years is probably quite a queer thing. There was a couple of kind of drawbacks with the K250 XP, however. You could only sample up to, I think it was 15 seconds stereo, 10 bit. And when you had sampled something, there was no way of storing it. There was no hard drive or floppy disk drive. You had to connect an Apple Mac to it. And my performance fee for Never Neverland didn't quite stretch to that. So I relied heavily on the internal presets. But if there was one thing that Kurtzfile did really, really well, it was orchestral. I think the patch was called Slow Strings 2. In fact, we referenced that patch for this thing, Epic Strings, that we made recently. So I just kind of pootled along, messing around with orchestral. First and most kind of meaningful piece that I did was my A-level kind of dissertation piece, if you will, a piece called Playground, which is a Steve Reichy systems music-y thing. I think what made it interesting, it wasn't like a particularly good composition. It was just that I was one of the only students who could kind of recreate the orchestral sounds because I had this sampler which meant that I gained a, a bit of interest from a couple of different music colleges. There are only one more, but I'm a one for four. Not a got all that? Good, because I'll be testing. No, in all seriousness, the problem was I went to a bit of a crap school um, that didn't really give me the grounding you need to do orchestral work. This meant that I basically had to get kind of a masterclass or a series of masterclass from the professor that would have ended up teaching me 
my degree course that I was going to attend in London. The only problem with that was that bloke was a bit of a knobber. One sentence he uttered would change the direction of my life forever. He asked me what I listened to when I wasn't kind of studying music and instead of telling the truth and saying gangster rap and porn funk, I said uh, jazz and he said there's one thing you'll learn on my course and that jazz is for children. And I don't know what he was trying to do with a comment as just absurd as that but I just didn't want to be a part of any of it. So in one fail swoop, I basically put a lid on my musical career and became a baker. But things were happening during this time. Things were being transformed. Home recording became affordable. This was the age of ADATs, of Atari STs, but it was the sampling technology that was at last becoming more affordable. No longer were people having to resort to uh, mortgaging houses to buy Fairlights. This was the age of the Synclavia, the Kurzweil, the Roland. Namely the S760, which didn't pack a massive punch, about 32 megabytes of RAM if you expanded it, but it was its affordability which was key. You see, up to that point, orchestral sounds were fairly one-dimensional, and it was Hans Zimmer who introduced the concept of dynamic crossfading, where you could move between different dynamic layers, say with a modulation wheel. And I guess the most important thing, a, a selection of articulations, embracing the fact that string players could play in many different styles. And the problems with samplers up to that point is you could only afford a few presets at a time, maybe 16. With the Roland S760 being affordable, he simply bought dozens of them. Putting an orchestra, a virtual one, under his fingertips. The birth of the virtual orchestra, the virtual instrument. Where the 80s had been proud presentations of the synthetic scores of Vangelis, of Stuart Copeland, of Jan Hammer, the 90s were going to be scores that put orchestras back centre stage and made them cool again. And I believe Hans introduced this new way of working, unleashed it on the world. I've heard this anecdotally with Ron Howard's film in 1991, Backdraft. What was interesting about that year was there was something coming out of Bristol that was also going to make orchestras cool again. Taking hip hop beats, putting them together with strings, and instead of rapping over them, singing over them. And the track to really blow things up for orchestras once again, of course. Massive Attack's Unfinished Sympathy, a track that made us all stop in our tracks and go, you can do that with an orchestra? That's allowed. And it moved us into this new age where the most revolutionary orchestral music was not being made by people out of conservatoires. It was being made by DJs and film composers. The 1993 track, Play Dead, with Björk and David Arnold from the film Young Americans, a film that no one has seen, was one that really sealed the deal for this new approach to orchestra, that in order to work with orchestras, you didn't need to go to conservatoires. You were able to listen to jazz. You were able to listen to gangster rap and 1970s porn funk. And whilst I admired these tracks and what these composers were doing, it didn't serve as enough of an impetus for me to revise my view of ever becoming a film composer. It was still very much a, a crushed ambition. Google didn't exist yet and there was no way of really finding out about what people were doing and how people were doing it. So I graduated from a Kurzweil 250 XP to an ESI 32, about the same RAM footprint as Hans's Roland's and eventually moved up to an E4 XT. But because my life was developing some pretty disastrous act at that point as a producer, bandwidth of my samplers was pretty much taken up with the cut and paste job of reorganizing and tuning vocals. So I was using Qbeat on an Atari ST, so no hard disk recording. By about, I think, 1999, I moved up to a Mac Performer, but still very much keeping the sampling functionality in the outboard. The thing that changed everyone's life, the vortex known as the box. For me, it was an empty cardboard box. It was a box about this big with just literally nothing in except for a piece of card. So the software was Logic Platinum, made by eMagic in those days. And they introduced this new thing that was already in the 
platform called the EXS24, an internal sampler. I never thought I'd really catch on, I thought I'd always be a hardware boy with my E4 XT, until I remember the first time I used a sampler in the EXS24, and then I had to use something in the E4 XT, and I just went, I'm just gonna stay in the box, and I was in. And then there was this other thing that didn't come in an empty box, it came in a box with a DVD-ROM. The mighty Giga Studio, which really changed things up. Because it meant that your sampling capabilities were only limited by not only the size of your PC, but the number of PCs that you possessed. So brought forth the age of Miroslav. Sonic Implant, that was my preferred one, and Vienna. Affordable, and I say affordable, it didn't entirely democratize things, but it made orchestral capabilities reachable with a little bit of investment. I didn't particularly take to the commercial libraries, so was involved in this thing that was set up by a gentleman called Jeff Rona, called the Russian National Orchestra, a bespoke club of orchestral samples being made out in Moscow, and I believe my investment was about seven grand. I went to my bank manager to provide the necessary funds, but the investment didn't end there. I had six whining PCs to run it off, but also this was the point at which everyone abandoned their Yamaha O2R mixing desks and instead invested in Pro Tools, not as a hard disk recorder, but more as a, a mixing platform. So you'd have so my Logic Mac, you'd have your Pro Tools Mac and six PCs, all running off eight glorious screens. This is the age before Instagram or Twitter or indeed cameras in phones, so I really regret not having any photographic evidence of this Matrix-style multi-screen environment. And I think everyone's aim was whether their Pro Tools rig was fully loaded, which I believed in those days was a maximum of six audio interfaces, each carrying eight tracks of mono signal via ADAT. So I had three PCs for strings, one for woodwinds, one for brass, and one for percussion, sitting there, whirring away, never to be touched for fear of having to venture into the no man's land, the cursed earth that was Windows 98. And so was born another somewhat meagre necessity, or innovation rather, the scroll wheel on the mouse. I think mine was made by Logitech. And uh, the reason for that was these new immense track counts. Yes, this was the birth of the age of the orchestral template. It's not the size of the template, it's what you can do with it. Anecdotally, Cliff Martinez, amazing composer, who was also a percussionist and drummer for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, he had this career policy of whatever was the last musical instrument he bought had to feature in the next score that he was commissioned for. He went to Jamaica, saw a Calypso band, went, I'm a percussionist, I should buy some steel drums, so he obliged. And then the phone went, Steven Soderbergh said, we've got another film to do, he said, what is it? And he said, it's a science fiction. So he employed the use of steel drums on his seminal score for Solaris, which has tormented the composing community to this day as it is a piece of temp love. I was working on a terrible film, which was also a science fiction film, which tempts this work, and there was no samples out there commercially that could make this extraordinary belly type of sound. So I went into a catering supplier's and found a whole bunch of mixing bowls and sampled them. And this is where it kind of all began for me. I was impressed by the extraordinary exotic overtones of these large, expensive crystal glasses and impressive round salad bowls. The overtones, whilst interesting and exotic, made for an exciting sound, but not necessarily a musical one. And it was this unassuming steel bowl, nothing to look at, that had a very boring tone that kind of changed my life. So here it is, the plain old mixing bowl. And I can confirm that this is one of the oldest samples I have. 27th of September 2004. That's a long time ago. And still use it to this day. It's just basically it's stretched across the keyboard, um, just loads of velocity layers. So let's just have a listen to... The 
tone itself is not particularly interesting, but it just has this slight wobble that gives it a kind of a voice-like tone, a voice-like vibrato. I forgot to mention that it was actually the quiet layers where the real magic happened. But this was just the beginning. I was starting to get hooked. I went to see the Motorcycle Diaries, the score, amazing score by Gustavo Santolalia, and was just really captivated by this guitar instrument. I couldn't quite figure out. It sounded like a mandolin made of glass. So I took it to Hobgoblin Music in Soho and asked their advice on what they thought this instrument was. Turns out it was a charango. Traditionally, the body of these things were made by armadillos. This one wasn't, it was wooden. Took it home, I can't play the guitar, so I got my brother, who's a bass player, to play it. I don't, I've been listening to this guitar sample that was really impressive, it was a nylon guitar. It was really impressive sounding, but why would you sample it like that? It sounded like something that no one would be interested in, with possible exception to maybe Sting or Mick Hucknall. It was so pure and correct and square. So I said to my brother, and I know some of you have heard this story before, but I said to my brother, he said, I want you to play every note differently. So kind of sampling 101, you know, so different parts of the finger, nails, I'm going to include mistakes. I have this feeling that the less uniform, the less square, the more interesting it's going to be. And here it is, the old Chirango in its original form. And I think the, the entire thing we managed to record consistently down 23 cents against 440, but anyway. And again, not a huge number of samples, just four velocity layers. By the way, you can get this free in its own plugin. It's not EXS in the links down below if you haven't already, Spitfire Labs, which is a lot of fun. But let's just have a look at the age of these. It's just really weird actually just digging out the original. I didn't even know how to spell Charanga, or Charango rather in those days. Yeah, so that's 2nd of October, 2004. And I remember saying to my brother, this is life changing. And I know that that's something that we say a lot throughout life. But this really was. Through the chaos came reality. Because of course, when musicians play instruments, they don't play them to make them sound like a series of uniform notes. It's open to interpretation. But that wasn't the thing that fundamentally blew me away. With hindsight, I think the character aspect of the sample was the thing that kind of created the epiphany in my own mind. I was writing something new, which was being interpreted by something that was recorded in the past. And it was around this time that I was actually barred from an online forum, I was accused of being a troll. I was simply questioning the method in which quite a famous sample company had gone about creating its samples in a very dry space with this, again, this incredibly uniform way of creating the individual notes, which in turn returned something that sounded wholly artificial. Fortunately for me, someone witnessed me being barred from this site, which caused a bit of a hoo-ha, and reached out to me on MySpace. And I relayed to him this experience I'd had with Chirango, and somewhat serendipitously, he'd had a very similar experience with a violin. So we went to the pub, and the rest is, as they say, history. We just came up with this idea of putting back in what other sample libraries were eradicating character, the chaos, the room, but also the way in which we recorded it. Why not, instead of trying to make samples, what if we instead tried to record music one note at a time? And so Spitfire was born, but not as a commercial enterprise. No, we thought, because it basically broke every rule of sampling at the time, that it didn't stand a commercial chance in hell. So we kept it to be a private club with a bunch of like-minded people who understood the concept and embraced it. After creating five orchestral libraries, which only I think a maximum of 30 odd people have used, the financial burden of running the world's most fantastic musical train set caught up with us and we decided to go commercial. 
and the way we went commercial was by adhering slightly more to the conventions of sampling, of, of trying to make things a little bit more consistent, deep sampling, lots of choice, that kind of stuff. But I still soldiered on with this fascination of character and chaos. And one day I was working on a film called The Secret of Moonacre, I found a piano. And I'd like to say this was no ordinary piano, but it was. It was really ordinary, a Yamaha upright, but it had this Celeste pedal, I didn't know the name of it then, which put this little layer of felt between the hammer and the strings. It's kind of like people's faces with some people are photogenic, some people aren't. And the same applies for sampling. Things that you think are kind of boring and plain and vanilla actually become quite magical samples. So I sampled this and again thought, this is too light, this is too not detailed, enough, it's too characterful, it only does one thing, this wouldn't be of interest out in the commercial domain. This has since become the lab's felt piano, which we then changed the name to Soft Piano, which wasn't even called... I always thought we called it Felted Piano. I think that's what we called it in its first iteration as Labs. It's now called Soft Piano, and it comes in its own plug-in. Again, Labs, linked below. Muted upright. We've done a lot of work on it since then, but back in the good old days, it was just, you can see, I've kind of done some curation of the different samples there, but no round robins, anything like that. <laughs> And my watermark is my little nail there. And that's the thing that I hear just, just everywhere, and that's when I know it's, uh, it's my little beauty. It's weird playing yourself, playing an instrument back in. Let's have a look. 10th of December 2008. And since turning it into its own plug-in, it haunts me. It follows me wherever I go. Usually on planes, I get really shocked when I'm watching a film score and I hear that fingernail on D3 or is it D4? And it's extraordinary to, again, to witness this real romance of sampling is things that are written this year being played by me 12 years ago. But the real game changer for me was a sample library I made because of the need for lunch. 13 parter, 24 minutes of music a day, the schedule we're on, and I've never really been one to farm this stuff out. So the perplexing conundrum for me was how am I going to eat my lunch? How can I design something that writes music for me whilst I tuck into a sarnie. And that was scary strings. Here they are. Again, you can get these part of labs, but here they are in their original form. And you'll see here that it's just these samples stretched over, I think, perfect fourths. And it was just this mixed band of, I think it would have been just three cellos, three violas, three seconds, or maybe even two of each. Um, now, I remember them in a single thing, so maybe it was just a couple, two desks per, so two, 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 two. There we go, that's a Q written. And when did we do these? So these are A, E, C, H, there we are. 17th of April, 2012. So I sat on Scary Strings for many years until we ran out of things to release on labs and just somewhat whimsically put them out one Christmas. And everyone went mental for them. So this opened up 
our world of evos, of swarms, these heavily character-led libraries. But not only that, this opened us up to the world of working with artists. Artists could see that their chaos, their character, could be imprinted onto samples. As Olafur Arnold says, you know, his, his music are like tapestries, but what he loves about making samples is he can control how each and every thread is woven. I guess the final piece of the puzzle in this journey for me was that, you know, the evos, the scary strings, is all very much taking traditional techniques and just allowing them to be performed, albeit in single notes. What if we were to take the actual performance of these notes and start from a point of innovation with how that sound is actually made? And this is the point where I came up with a concept of super saltasto, playing an instrument at the very edge of its capabilities. An uncomfortable point where the result is always not successful and that unsuccessfulness is something to be encouraged and celebrated. So these are Arctic Super Saltasto, so 15th of April 2015. And I think I did some violins as well. And that's the whole kind of precursor to the library that is now Tundra. But again, you can get this scary string, soft piano, tranga. I'm not sure about the mixing bowl. You get all of those in the Spitfire Labs, which are linked below. And getting back to that question that I was asked back in New York, the second part of the question, where I felt sampling was going. Well, for me, it's been a very personal and fulfilling journey, and I hope it will continue. So where I see my journey and the involvement I have with sampling going is very much to do with the relationship with musicians and artists. The way I write music has naturally been transformed by sampling. I very rarely do straightforward recording sessions with musicians. I'll often, mostly, book them on sample rates. And I think that this is what I find really exciting about the future of sampling, that it will remove the linearity from composition. And not only will it continue to progress as a form of technology, but I think it will change the way in which we approach composition. So for me, the future of sampling is bright, as is the future of composition. And what we learned from Orbis, which was us using recordings made by David Fanshawe in the 60s and 70s, was he didn't just capture the music, he didn't just capture the sounds, he captured the spirit. So whether it be us using the spirit of extinct cultures and languages and music forms and instruments, or indeed people writing music and creating masters using samples of musicians that we have recorded who are no longer with us, or indeed someone like my brother Keaton, who's a singer-songwriter, using the samples I made of him when he was 12 years old and his friend Johnny Sprunt before their voices broke. A scary, kiddie chorus. What is the future of sampling? Well, it's simple. It's time travel. So what's your sample history, your first sampler, your first sample instrument, and where do you think sampling is going? If you put comments down below, I'd be really interested to read your stories. Thanks, as always, for watching. Uh, hit one of those. A like is always much appreciated, and do subscribe if you haven't done already. People have been asking me about the Discovery Channel debacle. Yes, I will be discussing this on Arthur's seat tomorrow, and don't worry, I will not go up there without my ranting cape. Ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time I put a video up. See you next time.